Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where colors are vibrations and the vibrations are oh so good. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for hanging. And look, if I'm being honest, which I am all of the time, unless I'm not, but if I'm being honest and I had to craft an episode that holistically captured the vibe I'm trying to go for here... This would be such an episode. It has everything I want this thing to be about. A story virtually unknown to even niche audiences. A dynamic personality at the center of that story. A dynamic personality telling that story to us. And discussion on diverse subjects such as alchemy and color theory. And you couldn't ask for a more dynamic personality to be in the house than Dr. Amy Hale whose work on British surrealist and esotericist Ethel Colquhoun is the foundation for our conversation here. Amy is a scholar of all things occult and esoteric and has a PhD in folklore and mythology from UCLA. Her research and writing ranges from contemporary Cornwall to modern pagan and occult subcultures in the United States and the United Kingdom. She's written about topics as diverse as modern druidry, Cornish ethno-nationalism, pagan religious tourism, color theory, the occult, and extremist politics in modern paganism. We'll touch on some of those ideas and concepts throughout our chat here. And one note before we get to it, Amy's audio did have some inconsistencies in terms of volume, but I enhanced what I could, so hopefully it's not too noticeable. Regardless, this is a fine entry into the occulture canon, and if you like what you hear, there's another half an hour of this chat at patreon.com slash occulture. So let's sit back, relax, and vibe out to the color known as Dr. Amy Hale. Enjoy. <laughs> Amy Hale, welcome to the show. Very, very excited to talk to you. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Ryan. This is going to be great. No problem. I should have said Dr. Amy Hale, right? Because you have a PhD in folklore and mythology from UCLA. That's pretty awesome. That is true, and it is pretty awesome. Unfortunately, the UCLA Folklore Mythology program disintegrated and kind of split into different programs in UCLA shortly after or just before I got my PhD. But even at the time, it was one of two or three places in the United States where you could get a PhD in folklore and mythology. So I'm, I'm a pretty rare bird in that regard. Yeah, I thought that was pretty rare to be able to get a PhD in that. I've never heard of a PhD program offered in those subjects. Uh, fun fact, too, I applied to UCLA and did not get really? in. Yeah, I, I did not get in. Ultimately, their loss, my gain, because the out-of-state tuition would have bankrupted my entire family, probably. But, you know, for some reason, I thought I wanted to major in film, and I applied to both UCLA and USC because of that. But anyways, I'm curious about your journey, though, to that point. You know, why do a PhD in folklore and mythology? Are those lifelong interests? Well, my, the way that I got the PhD in folklore was, was kind of interesting. So from the time that I was 16, really, is kind of when it happened. I had these really interesting parents who many people would have have loved the parental advice that I got because when I was a young teen, I thought that I was going to go into commercial design and graphics. And my parents said, no, what you want to be is an anthropologist. You want to study Celtic cultures. That's what you're (laughs) obsessed with. So that's what you need to do. I was like, great. Okay. So folks, what am I going to do with that job? And they said, well, we don't really know, but you just have to be really, really good at it. And then you'll get a job. Well, that was terrible life advice. It has made for a really interesting (laughs) journey. And so when I went to do my undergraduate work at New College in Florida, which is a small liberal arts college, which gave a lot of room for individual curriculum building, I went into anthropology. My BA is in anthropology. And I wanted to look at contemporary Celtic identities. And I cut my teeth on Ireland. And so I did my BA thesis on how Irish people were using and looking at mythology. This was the end of the 80s. And how they were, like how mythology, how Celtic mythology was meaningful to them. That's so kind of on the eve of the European Union. The Irish economy wasn't so great. So I was interested in even those contemporary dimensions at that point. And when I went into graduate school, I wanted to be an anthropologist. And at that point, 
the idea of Celtic identities was not something that a lot of departments had a specialization in for a graduate level. It was not the traditional area in which anthropologists in the United States worked. But I found somebody at, uh, in the folklore department, they actually had a strong Celtic studies department. And so I went to UCLA into their folklore de- department, and I studied with a Celticist there, Joseph Nash. He does uh, traditionally medieval Irish work, but there's still something about the way in which the idea of the Celtic has kind of infected the whole parameters of that field, which made it a fine working relationship. So I went into the folklore program where I also got, I mean, it was some of the greatest colleagues in that program I could ever have hoped for. We had a bunch of students doing American folk art. We had students who were doing ethnography in Haiti, a lot of people working with voodoo and Santeria. So I really got impacted with a number of different types of academic sensibilities. And then I went to Cornwall to do my dissertation and kind of stayed there. So I ended up working for the Institute of Cornish Studies, which is a department of the University of Exeter. And I did that while I was doing my dissertation on Cornwall. Yeah, wow, that is quite the journey for sure. Uh, speaking of academics, you know, you you also do a lot of work in and around the academic study of paganism, occultism, esotericism. You were a past editor of the Journal of the Academic Study of Magic, which I thought was cool. And you're also a member of a few different groups uh, who work in these areas as well. I don't know how long you've been involved in that particular area, but how would you characterize academia's approach to esotericism today as opposed to when you first got involved? It's been a really exciting and developing field. And I have to admit that I'm glad that I finally landed there. You know, when I started my academic journey, I was very allied with Celtic studies as a field. And I tried to make that fit, and it didn't ever really work with my interests. So I think the way that I ended up getting involved in esoteric studies and pagan studies is because while half of my doctoral dissertation was on Cornish ethno-nationalism, the other half was actually about paganism and the occult in Cornwall. Because really, you can't talk about Celtic identities without talking about or intersecting with paganism and the esoteric. So when I started out, esoteric studies as a field was not particularly well developed, didn't have a particularly high profile. And so I kind of, you know, hung out in Celtic studies. And then through a personal friend, Dr. Dave Evans, who ran the Journal for the Academic Study of Magic, I ended up taking over editorship of that with Dr. Susan Graff, who does uh, work on Yates, and she's really awesome. And that was really my first official foray into the field of esoteric studies. I think the academic approach to esoteric studies, well, there's a distinction between esoteric studies and pagan studies. I'm involved in both. I work uh, as the co-chair for the pagan studies, contemporary pagan studies unit for the American Academy of Religion. They're not the same field. They're allied fields. They're intersecting fields. They have some differences to them. One of the things that I want to say about the way that esoteric studies in particular is developing, I think that for a lot of practitioners who are not academics, there is this concern about the fact that academics frequently approach esoteric subjects in a different way. It doesn't mean that esoteric scholars can't also be practitioners. Many of us are. It doesn't mean that esoteric scholars can't be sympathetic to practitioners. Many are sympathetic, some maybe less so. I think that the important thing to keep in mind is that we're sometimes asking very different questions about the phenomena that we're looking at. So while a practitioner might be mostly interested in, say, questions of personal enlightenment or How does the universe work? How does information become revealed to me in a spiritual context? People who are studying the esoteric from an academic perspective 
even if they're interested in those questions too, might be saying, what are the frameworks that condition how we ask the questions that we're asking for personal enlightenment, if that makes any sense? So in what historical moments did these things arise as issues in the way that they did? So rather than looking at, say, universal knowledge and a universal spiritual experience, we might be asking different questions about how those are constructed, either historically, or if you're an ethnographer like me, how do people experience those, either in their daily lives or in a ritual context or other spiritual context? Does, does that help unpack that a little bit? Yeah, I think it does help unpack it a little bit. But I am curious, like, I'm not a practitioner. I'm also not an academic. I don't know what I am. But <laughs> I would think from a practitioner's perspective that you would... I don't know, maybe sort of have some beef with the academic study of magic or esotericism or paganism or whatever else. I mean, is that a common or uncommon thing here? Is that just a sentiment that I share as an outsider that sort of maybe uninformed? Oh, no, you absolutely hit at the exact core of one of the debates in both pagan studies and in esoteric studies. Now, the question takes on a very different characteristic, in my mind, as somebody who's involved in, in both fields. Looks a little bit different if you're in pagan studies, what that question is, than in esoteric studies. But yeah, there are a number of issues that I have seen that emerge in what we call the practitioner-scholar debate, which one of the things that I, I want to say to help give it a bit of a wider frame, this is a debate that happens in every sector of religious studies. So whether you are working in Islam, whether you're working in Buddhism, whether you're working in Tibetan studies, the divide between the knowledge that you have as a practitioner and the knowledge that you have as an academic is always a point of concern and debate. So in, in stating that, what I want to do is actually bring esoteric studies as a discipline into the wider field of religious studies. Because what we do seems unique and weird and marginal, but it's actually hitting on some of the major debates within ethnography and within, uh, within religious studies. So I don't want for people to think that this is un these are unusual issues, because in no way are they unusual issues. But within esoteric studies, one of the things that we tend to see is sometimes a concern about the way in which academics distance themselves. Really, we're talking about a debate about the nature of knowledge and how you receive knowledge, but also what is your authority to talk about certain things, right? So from a practitioner side, saying, wow, I've been through that initiatory ritual. You haven't, yet you think you've got the authority to talk about it. That's kind of obnoxious. Whereas somebody on the historical side might say, yeah, but I'm looking at the historical background of how that initiation ceremony developed. I'm interested in looking at maybe issues of, of why it worked. And besides, I'm being objective. You can't really comment because you're too far in the middle. Unfortunately, these things don't truly get resolved. But what they do is I think these perspectives inform each other really, really well. So from the academic side, being in dialogue and being in respectful engagement with practitioners can only make our work better. Even if you're not a practitioner yourself, you have the opportunity to listen and to learn and to widen your perspective about the things that you're studying by hearing the people who are deeply involved and invested in these. Do you know Thomas Sheridan or his work at all? No, I do not. He's in Ireland, and I just spoke with him recently, so his stuff is still top of mind with me. But he has a quote uh, in a recent book he put out. I want your opinion on this. This is the first thing you read in his latest book. It's called Sorcery, the Invocation of Strangeness. And he says that magic has gone the way of romantic intimacy, broadcasted to the world, and the power of the experience is gone. Sorcery must be secretive and precious. So I find that to be a pretty interesting statement. Uh, he is a practitioner, and so basically he has a beef with this sort of like flooding it into the mainstream somehow, right? Like whether that is through pop culture 
or through maybe even academia as well. What do you make of that statement? I think there's a common narrative, both among academics and even among a certain type of occult practitioner, that is the story of the disenchantment of the world. And it's the idea that the Enlightenment basically ruined everything that was special and secret and awesome about everything. And that prior to that, you know, everybody was full of mystery and kind of dancing in the fields. And, and no, I, I actually don't, don't believe that. Because when we look at people's actual spiritual experiences through time at every level, we have plenty of evidence from around the world that the world is a beautiful and magical and mystical place. And I don't believe that we are all disenchanted. I don't believe that we're all alienated because I see how people are using folk magic. I see everywhere in the world and what drives people to do magic, what drives people to still have mystical experiences where they are contacting entities from other planes. There is absolutely no evidence in my mind that the world is not a magical place. I also think that the embrace of occult symbols by popular popular culture, I'm fascinated with it. I think that there's something, I've written a bit about this recently. I do think that there's something about people's exposure to those symbols, which is for them, especially if they're not in those traditions, which is for them, edgy, dangerous. I think if you're actually involved on those paths, that that doesn't change. Somebody else, for me anyway, somebody else wearing a Baphomet t-shirt who may not be as in love with Baphomet as I am personally in a devotional way, it doesn't, you know, that does not get up my nose. I, and I think that there are maybe some practitioners who have seen this as kind of their special club for a very long time, and they don't want other people to know about it. And that's something they'll have to work on. Hey, speaking of Baphomet t-shirts, I just started selling one. So if you want a new one, go grab it at the store. I saw that and I think it's totally adorable. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. I love I, adorable I, I Baphomet. So. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, we tried to make it look adorable. So that is... I uh, think it's really great. <laughs> cool. So that was probably a good setup to really why we are here to talk. I mean, we haven't even touched on the book that you've put out recently. So you put together this book about a British surrealist and esotericist named Ethel Colhoun, whom you have a long history with. You actually received a research grant uh, in 2009 from the Paul Mellon Foundation for your ongoing research into her and her life. So before we get to the actual book, tell us a bit about who Ethel is and how you came to not only discover her work, but make it a large part of your work as well. I love talking about Ethel and... For me, in discovering her work, it's not only a journey of my, really all of my intellectual interests converging in one person, but it's also become a very personal journey because I've read other people who've had this experience. When you are doing biographical work with somebody, especially with somebody who is no longer here on the physical plane. You, uh, you develop a relationship with them and you develop a relationship with their work. And so there's so much about this journey, which has been remarkable for me and continues to be so. So Ethel Calhoun, I would say before, the, before maybe seven or eight years ago, she was primarily known, looked her up on Wikipedia or anywhere else. Most references to her were about her relationship with the British Surrealist movement. She was kind of seen for a while as a forgotten female surrealist, whereas women like uh, Leonora Carrington, Eileen Ager, Leonor Feeney had a higher profile. Ethel Calhoun was seen as there, but somehow lost. And so a lot of people knew of her as this kind of lost woman surrealist uh, associated with specifically British surrealists. But there were others because she wrote this funky little book in 1975, The Sword of Wisdom, which was the first biography, really, that's a very loose word for what this book is, but it was a book about the Golden Dawn. It was a book about the development of the Golden Dawn, mostly around the uh, 
founder of the one of the founders of the Golden Dawn, Samuel quote, McGregor Mathers. So she people in the occult community knew of her and knew of her occult interests. So when I started looking into her, I started because I knew that she was a surrealist and occultist who had lived in Cornwall. But what I have come to realize, and the thing that I want people to know about her, is that I firmly believe that Eiffel Colquhoun was the most sustained, in-depth, and committed female occultist of the 20th century. And that's a broad claim because there were another, a number of amazing, absolutely astonishing kick-ass magicians who were women in the 20th century. But her work as an occultist and her theories, especially the way they impacted her art, were absolutely voluminous. And just unpacking the unpacking what she had to know in order to, to create the body of work that she did is, is an incredible task, knowing and trying to understand, which I will never do, all of the source material. Just, you know, that's a lifetime project. But the way I found out about her was when I was working in Cornwall. So as I had mentioned, I was working in Cornwall for the Institute of Cornish Studies. And my job there was to help use the idea of Celtic identity in Cornwall to promote cultural and economic development. So I was pretty much steeped in the idea of Celtic identities in Cornwall. And if you know Cornwall, you know that those actually do include the pagan and esoteric settlements and also pagan tourism that has been such a huge part of Cornwall for much of the 20th century. So, you know, I kind of felt like I knew this world pretty well. And I was down in Penzance with a friend of mine who was the curator for the West Cornwall Art Archive. Cornwall has a lot, an amazing artistic heritage, and particularly centered around two schools in West Cornwall, the Newland School and the Modernists of the 1940s and 50s. They were in St. Ives. And so she knew a lot about art. She said, oh, have you heard about Eiffel Colquhoun? I said, no. By this time, I'd been there for quite some time. I'd done my doctoral work. And she said, oh, well, her work is at the Tate. Her, all of her archives are at the Tate. She was a, she was a druid. She was really into witchcraft. Uh, she was a surrealist. She said, knew Alistair Crowley, which she didn't, but a lot of people believed that she did at the time. You've got to check her out. I said, why have I never heard of this woman? So I went up to the Tate, and this was in 2000. And at that point, none of her archives had been cataloged at all. So they brought out, I went up and stayed for a week and they just brought out boxes upon boxes of material for me to look at. And I saw letters to Doreen Valiente. I saw a whole bunch of of magical experiments and sigils, letters about her time in the OTO, letters to Man Ray, just like little tantalizing slips of his address in the 1930s. I was like, okay, this is crazy. This woman knew everybody. This is nuts. So I went back to my boss. I said, oh my God, I've got to do something on this woman. And he said, okay, well, next year we'll get you some money and um, you can go for it. You can go for this book. Well, by that time, I actually left Cornwall and returned to the States. This was in 2001. And they started cataloging her material. So it was offline for quite some time. And I really picked up the project again in 2007 when I started going back and forth to, on my own dime mostly, to just sit in the tape and do notes and do notes. Then sometime after that, I think it was maybe two years later, I discovered all of the work that was held of hers in the National Trust. They hold most of her visual archives that were left, although those two are uncatalogued. So it's really been a very, very long journey to get here. And it's, it's been absolutely amazing because she, she left so much to go through and some of it is unbelievably complicated. Just from what I've seen so far, it is very complicated, but hopefully by the end of the chat here, at least on this one specific piece that she's worked on, we can make it less complicated because it is really cool. Uh, so the book is called <laughs> the book is called Tarot as Color, and the title is taken from a solo exhibition that Ithel put on in 1977 at the Newland Art Gallery in Cornwall. 
it was the fifth of five such exhibitions over the course of uh, probably like 15, 16 years or so, I think. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the time and the other exhibitions leading up to Tarot as Color. I'm curious if these other exhibitions were part of like a series. Did they have similar themes? Were they just one-offs? I'm also curious about a question that you posed in the book. What drew a surrealist to the dreamy, otherworldly isthmus of Cornwall to begin with? Well, the thing that, that drew her there, her relationship with Cornwall started in the 1940s. First of all, what drew her to Cornwall was because she considered herself to be ethnically Celtic. Now, she was born in India, and she always believed, it was going to be kind of roundabout, so hang with me here. She believed that because she was born in India, family had long colonial history there, that that was where, that was like the major imprint on her soul. And she felt like she was kind of robbed of what she believed were her native spiritual traditions of Northern India. And she felt that for her Celtic people's spiritualities were closest to those of Northern India. Now, I just want to say all that's kind of problematic, but that's what she believed. And she felt that Cornwall, she started going there in the war, started going there as Many people who lived in London during World War II were taken out and moved to Cornwall during bombings to keep safe. And so she was a uh, she was an evacuee and started going down there. Some of her earliest works from there are from around 1940 when she started drawing some of the, the megalithic monuments there. And she really took to it. And so she started kind of settling there. She was kind of going back and forth between. London and Lamorna and West Cornwall from the late 1940s and settled there permanently in, in the late 50s. But she felt that this was really her spiritual home. She felt that as a Celtic person, she felt ethnically Celtic, that this was a place that would be suitable for her. And that because she was ethnically Celtic, that it predisposed her to surrealism because she believed that Celts were more prone to second sight and to mystical experiences, and that they were closer to the other world. And the way that she practiced surrealism, which we see in this tarot book and in the deck out of intelligence and in pretty much all of her work, is uh, she used automatic techniques, which were based on the connection you would make with your subconscious. So basically, it was just there were, there were, a, there were a number of automatic techniques that she used. You may have heard of automatic writing kind of comes out of the spiritualist tradition. That was kind of the foundation for a lot of the surrealist movement. But she used things like uh, decalcomania, which was pouring paint onto a surface and then seeing what kinds of images emerged from that. And she felt, as a Celt, surrealism was an appropriate art form for her. Cornwall was an appropriate place for her to be. So that's how she ended up in Cornwall and why Cornwall ended up being uh, such an important focus. Now, she settled in, in West Cornwall in a small town called Hall, which is a village that is very close to Newland. Now, Newland had an art school in the late 19th century, known as the Newland School. It's delightful. I love Newland art. I don't know if you've seen any of it, but it's, it's very, very romantic. It's all bathed in these kind of pastel colors and it focuses on mostly fishermen and the, the culture surrounding the fishing community in, in Newland. And it makes it look very dreamy and sensual, but at the same time, very salt of the earth, working class. About as far removed as anything Eiffel produced that you could imagine. Um, the other thing that was going on in Cornwall was the modernist school. And she hated modernism. She, she didn't, well, as an art form, she really didn't feel that what she was doing was that kind of abstraction. In fact, she didn't really feel like she was doing abstraction at all. So her being in this space was, was kind of awkward. It didn't really fit with the history and cultures that were going on exactly where she lived when she was doing these particular exhibitions. But the Newland Gallery was really about a mile down the hill from where she lived. 
And she did some other exhibitions in Penzance, which was also very close by. It's right next door to Newland. But they were not particularly themed in this way. She did a couple of, of retrospectives, which were kind of bits and pieces of her other work, but they weren't focused like this particular exhibition. And what's interesting about it, as I, as I kind of say in the, in the book, it seems like it was displayed and done in a very awkward way. Because you could think about how something like this might have been presented, but it wasn't. The cards were kind of crammed together in five different big frames. And there was this really totally confusing tarot essay that went along with it. it. You know, I kind of wonder what would anybody have made of this? Because it didn't look like if you were a tarot enthusiast, it wasn't going to push your buttons in the 1970s. There was nothing of this that was going to be comprehensible unless you were a complete golden dawn freak. So what I've kind of hypothesized that, and, and I've seen from other letters and, and heard from people, that she had a relationship with the Newland Gallery that made it so that she could occasionally exhibit there, but it was not ultimately a comfortable relationship. And it didn't end well. She ended up falling out with the folks from the Newland Gallery. I'm pretty sure this was the last exhibition that she had there, which is a little bit unfortunate. But then this work disappeared after that. She never intended for them to be to be produced as a tarot deck, though. The other exhibitions then that came before that, did they tie into this one at all? No. 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 Okay. They were all they were all they were all different. I don't know a whole lot about exactly what was there. There are catalogs that that exist, but they did not tie into this one. This was a completely distinct project that she did. Yeah. And I think you already answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyways, because, you know, as far as the tarot as color exhibition itself goes, you set it up like it's this sort of mesmerizing visitor experience, but it's sort of a tease. And the way it was actually displayed, like you said, it was pretty lackluster. You said it came with this really confusing essay, but how was the actual exhibition laid out when you walked into the the art gallery? It was in... I don't know if it was on one wall. It's hard to explain the size of these frames and the way in which these were kind of crammed in there. So it was organized according to her schema of how the cards should be organized. And they were just in these, they were just in these giant frames with the titles of the cards underneath them. And then I don't know if they were all together on, on one wall, but it, it wasn't like there was a showcase on each of the cards or even each of the groupings. I also don't know what the essay looked like as it was put. I'm presuming that it was, was probably copied and put next to it for people to read because that's, I guess, what happens and what, what you tend to find in, in gallery settings. But it would have looked, it to my mind, kind of jumbled together. And I, I always felt with this, why did they do it that way? Were they humoring her in putting this on for her? Because they didn't make it compelling, and I don't really feel like justice was done to them. I think some of that was actually probably her idiosyncratic wanting to put these together as she saw them grouped. But that doesn't necessarily make for the best exhibition. But she kind of knew better than that. I mean, this is a professionally trained artist who had had, you know, dozens of exhibitions. So there are a lot of questions about why this was done the way that it was. If you had to guess, what would you say? There may be people out there who know the details of how this happened better than I do. My feeling after having read correspondence about the Newland Gallery in the years after this exhibition, I think Ethel wanted things her, and this is pretty much the story with her across the board. Ethel wanted things the way she wanted them, whether they worked in her interest or not. I think there was probably a combination of the gallery owners doing her a solid by putting on this exhibition and her wanting to be very uncompromising in the way that she put these pieces together. And I hate to say that Eithel didn't always work in her best interests, but she didn't. And the other thing was, you know, if you, if you look at the essay that she wrote 
to accompany this exhibit, which is in the book. The way in which she understood this material and had so embodied it and understood it, I think that she probably had trouble getting out of that to mediate it for other people in a way that would have made for a more successful exhibition. I think she's so close to this that the, as the level of esoteric detail in this, that was her every day. That was, you know, that's just how she saw the world. But I'm not sure that comes across, would have come across to anybody else. Well, when you look at this, and I'm going to call it a deck because I don't know what other word to use to describe it. I mean, it's an exhibition, yeah, but the way that we, I guess, interact with it now, it is laid out, especially in the book, more like a tarot deck. So I'm going to use that yeah. term to describe it. But you said that, that there... it was it was set out as a deck, just so just to, to make that, okay. that clear, okay. that there were individual cards. Each of these, these uh, paintings was an individual card with an individual title. And so they were organized by rows in these giant frames. So it was presented as a tarot deck. Okay. Well, you said in the book then that this tarot deck moved people away. And this was Eithel's intention to move people away from the material preoccupations that drive many people to the tarot. And she instead wanted them to, you know, sort of commit to the transcendent. I was wondering if you could explain what she and what you meant by that when you wrote that in the book. And I think this is kind of probably something in her that changed over the course of her life and her work with the tarot. She obviously, as any occultist, had interest in the tarot from very early on. And a lot of the writings that she had done, notes she had taken, very uh, representational. And, you know, kind of as, as we would imagine traditional tarot cards to be. So I think toward the end of her life, though, she was much more interested in the idea that the material, and I find this a lot in, in occultism, that the material plane is somehow corrupt. And that in order to really reach enlightenment, that you need to be working on planes that are higher and more evolved. So the less material your interests, the more evolved you are. I personally think that's a highly arguable point, but that's where she was at with this material. The other thing that I, I wrote in there about this is that there's, there's frequently in, in the history of, of tarot when we start seeing the first, now I'm no tarot historian, but this is something that I've, I've gathered from, from the things that I've seen. When we start seeing the use of tarot and the way that, that when Dex, when the first deck, the writer, uh, Waite Smith deck, comes out in 1910, 1909, there's this internal dynamic which does not particularly set well with itself. So we've got the first part, the major arcana, which is supposed to be the journey to enlightenment. You know, we see the fool's journey. And so you've got this kind of allegory of enlightenment in the first bit. And you're cautioned that in in a lot of early tarot books and a lot of early writings about the tarot that Really, this, these decks should be for gaining enlightenment, for contemplation, for helping you understand your own journey. But, you know, you shouldn't use it for fortune telling. But if you've got to, here's how you do it. So there's this kind of internal tension around tarot that I feel is there. Because you've got the, the second half of the, the deck, which are the, uh, which Eiffel refers to as the decanate cards, which are a, a lot more uh, earthy you know, the ones that we see kind of derived from, from playing cards. And, and those are a little bit more earthy, maybe a little bit more predisposed for people who want to, to do kind of fortune telling or divinatory readings with them. But this has always been a tension in, in tarot with the development of, I think, Western esotericism since, and, and the way that, that esotericists have always used, have used tarot cards since they started to in the 18th and 19th century. But there were people who were very specifically engaged in tarot only for contemplation. I refer to Paul Foster Case in there as a tarot theorist who really stressed that you should use these cards for contemplation. So by the end of her life, because she did this when she was 71 years old, by the end of, of Eiffel's life, she was really promoting using these cards as kind of a perfected tarot 
where we're not looking at the story. We're looking, we're not looking at about how to use them to, to divine or to understand where you are at any given moment, but it's to help get you somewhere else. It's to help get you out of the material and get you focused on the spiritual and also making contact with other entities that can help uplift you and uplift your spirit. Yeah, tell us a bit more about Eithel's interest in the occult, because you mentioned in the book some of her early writings focused on subjects like alchemy, Kabbalah, Anakian magic, too. I thought that was really interesting. How deep did her interest really go here? Oh, so deep. She was writing in her notebooks as a schoolgirl about alchemy and astrology. So even before she was, was 20, she was starting to get a command of these subjects. When she was studying at the Slade, when she was in her 20s, and she encountered her cousin, Edward Garston, who was involved with the Alpha and Omega Golden Dawn Lodge at the time. She joined the Quest Society, which was uh, GRS Mead's kind of really super popular post-theosophy occult group. And she kind of found herself in this amazing occult milieu where she could study all of this stuff with intensity with a peer group. Actually, prior to that, she was doing alchemical plays in based on alchemical texts while she was in school. So she started, she hit it hard from a very early age. And by the time she was writing things for the Quest Society in 1930, she wrote something on alchemy, which was unbelievably advanced. Uh, she was writing fascinating, I think, very, very in-depth theological statements about ideas of taboo and blasphemy when she was 22 years old. She had an amazingly bright and quick mind. I think that her first love was alchemy. And after that, Kabbalah, Tantra, she was very heavily invested in uh, Kabbalah. She also joined a lot of magical orders, uh, most of which were, were hermetic, not entirely, most of which were, were dedicated to hermetic mysteries. She's also interested in things like the fourth dimension, which played into her, how she viewed tarot as kind of another portal to other dimensions. She was really into the fourth dimension as an esoteric principle. So she was very, very dedicated. A lot of her visual work, which obviously there are a number of pieces which were created for display, but a lot of her visual archives were actually magical experiments. So she would look at, she would use colored Kabbalistic formulas for conjuring angels or for building up hypercube portals. I mean, she was really into it, but not just reading about it. She was doing things with it. So I'm assuming her interest in alchemy, which I have an interest in as well. It's probably my primary interest, but I'm assuming that hers was more in line with the self-development or spiritual side of it as opposed to the material side of it? So this is super fun. And I, I, lo- I love talking about this tangent. So we're going to go on a sex tangent here for a minute. That's Hopefully. probably the best kind of tangent, Amy. Go ahead. Hopefully <laughs> not discourage your viewers. But uh, I'm going to go into this because I think this, this shows how awesome and amazing and friggin' radical this woman was. So we're going to talk about her Eiffel porn for a little bit. So she didn't just see alchemy as a vehicle for personal transformation. She saw it as a vehicle for societal transformation. Uh, She saw this on a really big scale. And one of the things that she started working on quite early was the idea in alchemy of conjunction and of the conjunction of the male and female, which obviously we see this throughout the occult corpus. It it comes out in a bunch of different ways with whether it's Kabbalah or alchemy or, you know, shows up in in the Golden Dawn, various formulas for Tetragrammaton. Well, she was into all of it. And some of her earliest work in alchemy is, it starts out with being about and using various alchemical formulas. So this was in the earliest play that she wrote. It was featured in her alchemical novel, The Goose of Hermogenes, which came out in the 1960s, but she started writing it in the 1930s. So very interested in the idea of integration 
and using principles of alchemy to enact the great work, which she saw as, as this integration. But she also was using principles of alchemy visually to represent the unification of male and female. She, she believed that the, the unification of male and female societally would be the only thing that would move us forward to a next stage of being. So to this end, in the 1940s, she was using Kabbalistic and alchemical principles to design hundreds and hundreds of watercolor paintings and sketches of people having very, very explicit and sometimes uncomfortable looking sex to represent the various minglings of bodies in this alchemical transformation that would lead to not just the individual transcending their own gender, but society transcending gender entirely. Now, this isn't somebody who had necessarily a, she didn't present in a particularly non-gendered way, although she was, she was also bisexual. But this was, I think, the key to a lot of the early alchemical work that, that she was doing. And so in 1941 and 42, she was doing all of these as magical experiments. They were private, but she had a whole body of extremely explicit alchemical work that she did and some bodies of writing that went along with it. So she was deadly serious about this stuff. Yeah, and I guess that interest in alchemy, one, it pairs well with her fascination, which we'll get to, uh, with color and space as well. But also the way that you described that she saw it, I think you can probably look at what's going on culturally and socially now and, and probably trace it back to the founding of the United States, for example. I've always seen America as an alchemical experiment itself. I don't know how you see that or if you have had similar thoughts, but I could see how transforming society is top of mind with maybe even some modern-day alchemists. Well, the people I know who are interested in alchemy, I would think would, would probably agree with that, although I'm not sure necessarily sure how it is that, that they personally would use alchemy. Uh, I think one of the things that I appreciated about, and it's funny because I felt all of a sudden I'm not political. Well, she was, she was. And, you know, her politics didn't really necessarily set along particularly clear lines in terms of right or left, but she was very interested in societal change and things getting better and also things getting better for women. She was absolutely a feminist. So I think that, well, there are a lot of people who might have been, especially early on, wanting to use alchemy as, as a tool for, again, contemplation, as you know, the idea of the philosopher's stone or great work being something that is of a very personal nature. She, you know, she was inspired by, by Yeats in a lot of this. She saw it as something bigger, you know, as above, so below. And she saw this as something that was, uh, was really, really important for both men and for women to, treat, to achieve true freedom and, and, and liberty because this was something that was holding us back. And so she felt that an understanding of those not just kind of electrical currents, but also alchemical currents and an alchemical project, which helped to bring those energies together, uh, was something that was important not just for the individual to understand, but for everybody as a whole to take on board. And I think that's radical. I think that's awesome. I would agree. I think that's awesome as well. And that's sort of where I'm at now with how I view that subject and maybe even that practice as well. So, you know, we mentioned the Golden Dawn a few times. She wasn't a member of the group, but you mentioned in the book that she took a lot from their system, including the use of color, which I just alluded to. That's obviously evident in the title of the book and the exhibition itself. And this helped her express her own theories about art and magic. And let's stick with color uh, for just a moment. You said she developed a keen interest in the applied science of color, its magical and symbolic uses, and its impact on people's physical and psychic responses. This is where things may get a little complex like we talked about in the beginning. So break that down for us. What does all that mean? You don't make it easy, do you, Ryan? That's excellent. So I, I am enthusiastic and excited about 
the Golden Dawn Youth of Color. And I want to cheerlead for the Golden Dawn a little bit because uh, a lot of people today, especially post chaos magic, which I also love, there are a lot of people who think, oh, Golden Dawn magic is, is so old fashioned and stuffy. It's a bunch of old guys in robes and, you know, just waving wands around and so much stuff. Golden Dawn at the time was doing some amazingly radical things. And one of the things that they did, which obviously Eiffel would have resonated with, was that they initiated men and women on an equal level and believed that both men and women had access to the current. Awesome, brilliant, fabulous. So it allowed for some really brilliant women to come forward and to actually develop magical theories in a way that we didn't see. And there's still some of the pioneers of, of Western magic came from women in the golden dawn. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the idea again, that, that magic or the golden dawn in particular was, you know, kind of pre-modern and, and old school. A lot of occultism in the late 19th century was really engaging with science and, you know, science was kind of messy back then. We didn't really have a great handle on the things that were science, but people were talking a lot about people were working toward empiricism, working toward relating observation to empiricism. And the Golden Dawn was, was actually engaged in this. So you had these incredible artists like Florence Farr and Mina Mathers. Mina Mathers was the wife of McGregor Mathers. She was also a trained artist. And what they were doing in the Golden Dawn was they were working with contemporary color theory to help give their initiates these intense experiences, which you can really only do with the kind of color mixing and stuff they were doing at the time. So I'm going to try to give you an example of this. It's something I was thinking about the other day. It's very hard for us with all of the color and sound that we have right now. Imagine living in a world with no artificial color or almost no artificial color. And the only places that you might see really intensive pigments would be in art or fine art. The world was a much duller place. And I don't mean that in a bad sense. It's just we live in a very visually oversaturated world. And in the 19th century and prior to that, we didn't quite as much. Things were a lot more toned down. So the Golden Dawn believed that colors were entities. You know, they say colors are forces, the signatures of forces. So pure color was a way that you could contact other entities, archetypal entities. And so one of the the things that they would do, they would work with what's called simultaneous contrast quite frequently, also known as flashing colors, which you see in the work of Van Gogh. You see it in the work of Surat. So if you're standing up, it's basically the idea of when you put opposing colors next to each other, like orange and blue or red and green, that they vibrate a little bit. And so you kind of, if you look at a Van Gogh close up, a lot of it is this orange and blue right next to each other. And it almost gives the painting this kind of visual hum to it. And a lot of artists who were working with with color theory at the end of the 19th century were working with uh, using simultaneous contrast to really give their their audience an intense experience. The Golden Dawn was doing this magically. So imagine, again, you're living in this kind of, you know, not visually saturated environment. And you see a sigil of green on a background of red. And it's super, super intense. Stare at that for five minutes or even less and then pull it away. And you've got this image that it causes retinal burn. So you've got this image in front of your face. It's going because it's vibrating. That's the kind of magical technology the Golden Dawn was working with. Because they knew that colors were not only, you know, not only portals but that they had a physical impact on people's bodies. And so they were using this technology spiritually. Color theory is still a very important part of the Golden Dawn. And I think that it's an incredible contribution that they made to modern magic. So 
obviously they were they were working with contemporary art theory, but there were other people at the time, like I mentioned in the book, Le Corbusier and uh, Amade Ozenfant and others, tons of others, were working with the impact of color and space. Because we know that color has an impact. Obviously, you know, research into this has continued. So what happens when you paint a room blue? What happens when you paint a room pink? What kind of impact does it have on somebody's moods? Now, they weren't, you know, they weren't the only people who were working with this. It's also worth mentioning that the, the theosophists had their own, did their own work with color and the idea that color was, in, you know, that, that color signaled particular thought forms. But I'm talking about something slightly different because the Golden Dawn did something different. And these people working in, in architectural schools were doing something different again. And Eiffel was interested in how color impacted people. And so she would engage with systems that looked at how color impacted a person's spiritual perception and a person's physicality. And that, you know, I, I think that those became cornerstones of, of how she worked. But she was particularly interested in the Golden Dawn system, and she used that throughout her life. In fact, I think you can take the, the wheel at the color wheel at the center of the Golden Dawn Rose Cross. There's a color wheel at the center of it. And I think that you can unlock the meanings of a lot of her automatic paintings by plotting along the colors that she used on that color wheel to figure out what what other things was she trying to tell us. Yeah, a couple notes on a couple of things you said. The theosophical color system and their theories, they had much more of an impact on the modern art world than the Golden Dawns, even though... When I look at both side by side, I am much more in line with the way that the Golden Dawn views this as well. And then also, you mentioned the contrast. Like you said, you know, orange and blue sort of contrast. Maybe they create this vibration, whether it's from the painting itself or maybe in the viewer or in the experiencer of it. And that's an idea I think that they called the vault. Is that right? Yeah. So first, I'll, I'll talk about the theosophist and then I'll talk about the vault because I think the vault is, again brilliant, brilliant spiritual technology. So the theosophists did have much more impact on the modern art world. Kandinsky wrote a book in 1918 that really was based off of the idea of theosophical thought forms. And it's not dissimilar in the sense that what he's putting forward in that book that was the idea that colors very specific things in an objective way, right? This is how the theosophists thought of it. So, you know, if, if you had a bad thought, then it might show up in an aura of pink around your head or something like that. And they, they broke down the, you know, happy thought, impure thought, and they, they attached those to colors. And their belief was that if you had any kind of psychic ability that you could pick up these color thought forms. And so the idea of color, not just symbolizing, but having these objective realities and impacts became popular with, with modernists. The reason that I think that the Golden Dawn didn't is that Golden Dawn is complicated and challenging. And also during that point, it was initiatory. So, you know, this was before anything was released about the Golden Dawn. It's not like their color theory has ever been presented in a way that's been until recently with the internet, particularly coherent. I just think that the reason that it never really impacted people was that it was too wound up in other esoteric systems like Kabbalah. And it frankly just was not as, as accessible as theosophy was because theosophy was everywhere, very, very impactful and very accessible. So I'm kind of with you there myself. I, I like GD stuff. So the vault is absolutely incredible. And I've seen sketches that Eiffel did for a vault in her own archives. That would have been cool. The vault is a seven-sided chamber that was mythically inspired by the vault of Christian Rosenkrantz. And it is basically the incubator for an adept. It is paneled with different planetary and magical symbols. 
on squares of contrasting color. So essentially, again, imagine you're living in this not very saturated world and you go into this intensive seven-sided chamber for ritual purposes where everything is these incredible flashing colors and these intense pigments. And you're just doing magic stuff in that box for a while. And you see, most likely, you will see all of these images still floating around you after you're out of the vault. That was the idea behind it, is that you would be, these things would be vibrating in front of you as you're doing this ritual, and then they stay with you after you're done. I think that's incredible. I think the fact that, that this was designed for ritual purposes in it, the period in which it was is just amazing. Yeah, you know, it kind of reminds me of this trendy immersion therapy or these float tanks where you're just sort of locked into this thing, you know, and then you come out and you just take the feeling that you were that you had with you for that, you know, 30 minutes or 60 minutes and then you come out and it's the world still feels that way to you. Pretty interesting thing. I would love to uh, experience the vault. So if any listeners out there have access to one, please give Amy and myself a call, right? <laughs> I know where where some some still exist, and uh, I think generally it's it's a, an initiatory secret. But there, you can actually find some online too if you want to see what one looks like. Do do a search on Golden Dawn Vault, and you'll see some of the beautiful ones that are extant out there right now. Even and you know if you find the right person, maybe they'll you'll be lucky enough to get a tour. But I can just only imagine what the intensity of that experience would have been. You know, exciting, frightening, but absolutely transformative. Did you have any favorite cards? I do. But, you know, they're just, they're for, like, I'm actually really drawn to a couple of the Earth ones right now. Uh, I love the Prince of the Chariot of Fire. And also, I also really groove on uh, the Princess of the Silver Star, which is a High Priestess card, just because it's so silver and luminous and looks unlike anything else that we've got in this deck. And it's, you know, I just, I, I love all of them. But those for me are just so... You know, and at different times, I'm also drawn to the complexities of different ones just because of, of how I might be feeling in any given day. But those tend to be two that I return to in terms of their beauty. Yeah, I'll tell you, the one that grabbed me first was the Lord of Defeat because it yeah. reminded me it reminded me of a vagina. And Lord knows <laughs> that has defeated me many times. So... <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I think we yeah. all feel that. Well, you know, I I wanted to say that that the the, the deck out of intelligence that she did. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of those pieces, but those are those give Georgia O'Keeffe a run for her money any day. They are, I believe, explicitly vaginal. I think they are characterizing something that she sees as essentially female about. The, uh, each of the, the sephira, the, the sephiroth as a whole, as being containers for, for emanation. So a lot of times, if you think you're seeing something vaginal in her work, you probably are. Well, that's good, because I didn't want that to be like, oh, I'm just seeing vaginas all over the place. But I, I was flipping <laughs> through there, and that was the first one that stood out to me as explicitly vaginal. But there were a few others throughout the rest of the deck. I don't remember the names of them. I did not write them down. But yeah, so okay, I'm not I'm not too obsessed with this then, because that, was, oh, yeah, that was a concern of mine. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. And, you know, her, her other work, one of the most amazing things, I love showing this one at conferences, she did a series of, of pictures that, like in her archive, they're, they're disconnected, but I've seen the sequence. It starts out as a cave and a beach, and then the cave gets a little bigger, and the cave gets a little bigger. And by the end of the sequence, this cave is actually, not kidding you, a gynecological study with like a whole moon sequence coming out of the center of it I mean it's just wow you know and so I, I call it just you know her a landscape study because that's frequently how she saw things she was she did not hesitate to go there uh, sometimes extremely explicitly and sometimes she's just telling you what she thinks about something and so now if you're if you're seeing something vaginal you're probably seeing something vaginal 
Well, I guess I do have one more question for you then. What do you hope, besides vaginas, that people who interact with the deck through your book, what do you hope they take from it? Well, first, of course, I want them to see the incredible beauty and skill and forward-thinking nature of this deck. I think it's an astonishingly beautiful deck. But what's really important for me also in putting this out there is that the work of Ethel Colquhoun throws down a gauntlet to anybody who has missed the engagement and the contribution of women hermetic magicians. I want people to see the incredible command of theory that went into this project. I want somebody to see not just what somebody theorizes about magic, but what it looks like when somebody is living it on a daily basis. And so when somebody has got this much command of the material as she did throughout her entire life, I think that it's important that we start to see more of what female magicians experience, think, and live. There are some, you know, I, I think that we're going to see a lot more of that in the next year. But, but she was an exemplar, not just of a woman magician, but of any magician. She was a really, really incredible human being. And I want people to see that. I can definitely see that just from the, you know, really, I'm just familiar with her now through what you've written and presented about her. So, but just from that small sample size, I can see a, a brilliant artist, a brilliant magician, which might be the same thing, actually. Brilliant thinker and just somebody who you can see why she may have been cast off because she may pose a threat to that patriarchal sort of hierarchy that we've been immersed in for all these years, right? Yeah. and. I've heard people make comments saying, oh, well, she was a member of so many orders. She was just collecting degrees or she was just an armchair magician. And I'm like, oh, hell no. No, she was engaged with this absolutely 100%. And when, if, she, if she didn't make it past the doors with a particular order, it was brief, frequently because she just asked too many questions and they didn't suit her needs. You know, she was, um, I'm eager for more people to see and understand and recognize the, the, the level to which she went to. The thing is, though, that like this deck, you can, you can get it on, on, a, on an emotional basis. You can just look at it and say it's, it's amazing, it's beautiful. But there's a lot of the complexity that her work, of her work that is really only completely understandable when you get the theory behind it. And the theory behind it, a lot of her work isn't always as, uh, as accessible because it's so theoretically late. Well, speaking of accessibility, where can people access the book if they're interested in purchasing it? And where can they keep up with you and your work? So the book is The Tarot as Color, and it is available through fulgur.co.uk, the absolutely preeminent publisher of beautiful art and esoteric texts. I'm very glad to be going on this journey with Folger because Robert Angel does a beautiful job and he loves the subjects. And oh, also, I'm, I'm working on a biography of Ethel Colquhoun and I am excited to announce here that I will be doing that with Strange Attractor Press. It should come out at the end of 2019. They can keep up with my other work at got a lot of my academic pieces at Amy Hale Academia EDU, but also my personal website, which has more of my, my other pieces that I'm working on, which is amyhale.me, where I've got all of my news and, and relevant links. Well, Amy, this has been great. I hope that we at least were able to give the audience some context into her work, as hard as that has been. But I've enjoyed the chat. I hope you have as well. And I'd love to have you back oh, anytime yeah. to talk more about her work or anybody else's work because you've done a lot of shit that we could probably talk about too besides this. So let's keep in touch, please. <laughs> Absolutely, Ryan. Thanks. You are a really super interviewer and I've loved this opportunity to chat with you. Thank you so much. 
And there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Amy Hale for stopping by and smearing some of that sweet, sweet gnosis all over our ear holes. And there was plenty more smearing of it in the Patreon extension. We talked about Ethel's interest in the convergence of color, metaphysics, and space. Also talked about the Golden Dawn's book T and how Ethel interacted with that. Also got into a concept called the Cube of Space. And then we got into the actual tarot deck that the book is based on and talked about a concept called Psychological Morphology that Ethel used as well as the structure of the deck and how Ethel incorporated her idea of feminism into it. So if all that sounds like something you'd enjoy listening to, check out patreon.com slash oldculture and sign up for one of four levels of support. You can get extensions like this one for just two bucks a month, and you'll join fine folks such as Gideon, Amon, and Jim, who all hopped on board the esoteric endeavor recently. And if you're interested in seeing some of the artwork from Ethel's deck that was discussed here, check out the link in the description titled Tarot Illustrations. Anyways, an abbreviated outro because I am minutes away from going on my first vacay in two years, so I gots to get. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture... I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.